Welcome to week 15 of our Lunchtime Live series. I'm Chandra Luckett, Chief Marketing Officer here at Chris 180, and we thank you for being a part of our conversation today. Today, we're talking about the topic of coping with our emotions in difficult and uncertain times. As you all know, recently, we have been plagued by two different pandemics, the COVID-19 pandemic and the racial unrest that has plagued our nation for centuries, but is now coming to the forefront with the deaths of many Black men and women in our community. But how do we press forward in these times while also maintaining a good grip on our emotions? Today's panelists will discuss that and provide tips for you to move forward. Please, of course, as you always do, send us your questions and comments in the chat section on Facebook, Instagram, or YouTube, and we'll be happy to answer those questions live. This week, our panelists include Tashara Jones, who is a multi-systemic therapist at our Chris Counseling Center Gwinnett office, and friend of the show, Fonta High, who's director of our IOP recovery program called I Thrive. Ladies, take away conversation. Thank you, Sandra. So Tashara and I actually haven't had a chance to meet formally besides just a few minutes ago. And so I guess we can start off by sharing a little bit more about what we do here at Chris 180. Sure, sure. So again, I'm Tashara Jones. I'm a multi-systemic therapist. I work out of the Gwinnett County branch here in um, Georgia. Uh, basically, my job involves being a court-appointed counselor. So, you know, I work with youth who are at risk of being detained for any kind of juvenile delinquent behaviors. We pretty much work with the families. Um, overall, the multi-systemic needs, we work with all systems that deal with the youth. So whether it's school, probation, church, court, whoever we need to address or try to assist with, we do. We choose to get involved and try to figure out how we can help everybody to come together to uh, cultivate the success in the lack of um, reintroducing themselves to the detainment center. So pretty much what we do. And my name again is Fonta High. I'm the director of iThrive Recovery. And iThrive Recovery is a substance use disorder intensive outpatient program that serves children or adolescents rather up through adults starting at 18 all the way up through a geriatric age. And so an individual can be struggling with a substance use disorder or just challenges with it in addition to having some other mental health challenges and they would be appropriate for our program. Okay. Yeah, I think it's important to say the age dynamic. So I work with youth from, from anywhere from 13 to 21 if they're still under the juvenile um, justice system. So. The last time I was here, we were talking about substance use, and I was meeting with Jessica Donaldson, who sat in that chair, and we were sharing what we're seeing with our clients around substance use and the pandemic and how people are coping. So we're here today again to talk about how people are coping and managing their emotions, whether it's feelings of frustrations or otherwise, around these two pandemics. What are you seeing? Well... I am seeing a lot of issues around the pandemic and adjusting to it. There's lots of uncertainty around when I can come back out, you know, when is it safe to, you know, bring my kids back out, how's work going to go, you know. So basically just trying to get to the bottom of what's causing the frustration, you know. So figuring out what exactly pinpointing the frustration with these people and kind of trying to figure out how to help them cope through it. That's usually my job on a day-to-day -day basis at yeah. this point. Yeah, me too. What I'm seeing with clients is, again, Feelings of frustration, mm -hmm. anger, sadness, mm -hmm. helplessness, because no one knows when this pandemic with COVID-19 is going to end, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then not everyone knows what are the right moves to make to keep themselves and their family safe. Exactly. And now we got school about yeah. to open up. Yeah. So I know in my community where we live in the neighboring community, school systems have tried to do surveys mm -hmm. with families to see what people are comfortable with, whether it's coming back to school and then being opened up for person-to-person -person interaction, or there's just a virtual platform or hybrid, mm -hmm. and who knows what the right answer is. What are you hearing from parents around those decisions? I am getting mixed um, emotions. I have some parents who are really concerned because the numbers keep increasing and people are still going out, you know, and the restrictions are getting looser and looser. So I have some families who are extremely concerned around how that works. I myself, I'm also concerned because, you know, we are given this freedom to go out and the, set, the states and the cities are opening back up, but the numbers are rising too and we're kind of trying to figure it out. So I have lots of parents who are struggling with trying to decide whether it's safe to go out. I have other parents who are reluctantly having to go out because mm -hmm. of their work and the job market opening back up, yeah. but still having the, let's say, the, the camps closed down or things for the youth to do during the summertime closed up. So trying to balance that, you know, being at home and then not being at home with the kids who usually have activities through the summer that they can't participate in. So 
it's just a lot of mixed emotions as it relates to, you know, is it safe to go out? How do I go out? How do I incorporate my children when I go out? Mm -hmm. um, you know, just really what is school going to look like in the summer? I have lots of families who are not comfortable sending their kids back to school in that big setting with all those people. And I have some who reluctantly want to send their children back because of their work schedule and the inability to kind of be in both places at one time. So really trying to figure out how to navigate around this with them is has been the biggest challenge because I also have some concerns around, you know, how this is going to work and what is the second step. And then Another thing that's come up is, you know, the, the winter months are coming, you know, the flu season is coming. So being able to identify between, you know, the COVID-19 and just the normal, typical flu and parents having fears around that. So really trying to ease that anxiety. There's lots of frustration and anxiety around that. Um, it's not really um, something that I'm able to, to help them with per se because of the, the confusion around it, but just really trying to make sure that they have some good some good direction as far as what if. So if they do have to go back to school, what's that going to look like? If they are at home, what's that going to look like? And trying to plan around the what is. Yeah. Right. These are all very personal choices. Mm -hmm. And I know a number of my clients are certainly wanting to prioritize their health and their kids' health with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. But we also know that everyone has different learning styles, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of people, a lot of kids don't learn really well mm -hmm. with a virtual platform. Exactly. And then what if this is a child that has a learning disability or some other type of challenge, the virtual platform may not be ideal. Yes. And then yeah. not every parent has the privilege mm -hmm. to be able to work a hybrid schedule of on one day, off one day, exactly. back in school one day, virtual one day, or every other week, however the school system decides to do it. Mm -hmm. So these are really complicated decisions and it brings up a whole lot of frustrations and a host of a mixture of emotions. So let me tell you some frustrations I'm experiencing around that whole idea of if my child is home, mm -hmm. parents not having the education to teach their kids. Yes. So a lot of parents I'm dealing with, they're, you know, they're, they're undereducated or they don't have the education. They went to school 20 years ago. So the new method of teaching math is completely different. So the frustration around trying to learn, learn something to teach their children and then their children getting frustrated because the math teacher doesn't have this difficulty. So it's just a whole bit, a whole lot of, I think, additional training that needs to come with this if it is going to happen. So we have that whole social emotional piece mm -hmm. that kids are missing, that dynamic mm -hmm. when they can't engage their peers. Mm -hmm. And then we too, as adults, parents, mm -hmm. and I'm a parent as well, we're missing out yes. on that social emotional connection piece too, as we're limited with our connection. Mm -hmm. And then we have the whole unrest that we're seeing with the other pandemic, mm -hmm. with injustices against black and brown people that are happening in society. That adds to that. But we have a question before we go for it further. What's that question, Chandra? So this one is around the schooling and camps in summertime. Because I'm stressed between my husband and I's work schedule, I can't do another summer school or virtual camp. And now I'm worried my kids are going to be bored and I'm worried about next school year. And now the kids are wondering if they'll ever see their friends again. Yeah. What can I do to calm their fears and deal with my own? Yeah, that's a heavy one. Um, <laughs> typically, you know, having a conversation with the youth is a very important step first. You know, kind of helping them understand and bringing them on board with the pandemic and kind of trying to smooth things over by making it clear of, you know, we what we want, what we want for you guys. We expect you guys to be able to go back. So we want you to have this social outlet. However, this is what's going on now. And kind of really keeping the kid abreast as you move through the process. I think that's a really good thing too, because we are all experiencing a change. So it's not like mom is keeping the youth from from school because I don't want you to go. So it's it's a thing where you don't want the parent, you don't want to get frustrated trying to figure out how to answer the questions, but you also don't want the youth to be frustrated around the, the answers to the questions. So kind of just letting them know, I think the good step is informing the youth of what's going on, kind of really making it clear. And for the smaller kids who may not understand that, you know, being able to say, you know, let me figure out some inside things, you know, let me see how my backyard looks or my patio. Let me create a space for you where we can kind of, you know, have this, this time and maybe as it gets more safe, you know, introduce maybe one or two friends to come over and interact, you know, some safe friends. I think that just trying to promote that social interaction as much as you can is a best, is a best step, but really keeping the child abreast in a form if they can understand is a really good step too. I believe in that very much, Sushashara. So I believe in transparency mm -hmm. and making sure there's strong family communication. Mm -hmm. Having age appropriate communication mm -hmm. too is, is important. Mm -hmm. And it's okay for you as a parent to say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have all the answers mm -hmm. as parents. Yes. But then allow your child to see that you'll follow up, that you'll investigate, that you'll come up with appropriate solutions as much as possible. So that could look like 
social distance play dates. Mm -hmm. You can do that outside, in your yard, mm -hmm. on the porch, in the park. So there's some level of engagement because mm -hmm. I think so many of us are experiencing Zoom fatigue yeah. or messenger fatigue or whatever yeah. you're using in terms of that platform. We have another question. Yes, yeah, so this one comes from Instagram and the user asks, how do you recommend nonprofits and other organizations shift to truly serve families where they are during this stressful time? Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's an interesting one. I'm really proud of Chris and Eddie for their efforts to kind of try to implement that. As, as a matter of fact, I am a community-based counselor, so that's what I do. I travel within the Gwinnett County, and currently um, they are doing a lot of telehealth and a lot of opening up a lot of different doors via telehealth to kind of try to um, support this, this pandemic. And then in some instances, as this as the um as things open up, I think a good idea would be to include the parents or include the families in this in this thing. Ask them what do they what would they prefer? Would you like it if I come out to your home, or would you like it if we had a contact, or would you like a virtual um, session? Kind of give them that option, but really trying to move towards what's going on. You know, try not to fight it and try to see. I have had some therapeutic issues with trying to do telehealth, but it's mainly because of the adjustment process. But I feel like once the adjustment happens. You know, being able to offer that option of whether you want this in home or out of the home or kind of how you want to move through this is a, is a good step to try to transition with the, with the pandemic. Yeah, I think community engagement is key. One of the worst approaches that an organization can take is that whole idea of build it and they will come. Mm -hmm. You need to ask people what they need. Mm -hmm. Ask them what kind of supports they need, what's missing. Ask the question, how can I serve you instead of assuming what it is. Yes. So I, I highly recommend you approach it as an organization in that regard. Mm -hmm. So let's move on to some discussion about this other pandemic, okay. the racial injustice that we're seeing mm -hmm. in the black community, yes. right? Police brutality. What's coming up for you with your clients around that topic? Well, because I work with a lot of at-risk juveniles, you know, those with delinquent behaviors, this has been a very interesting topic because a lot of them are out in the community and are out there, you know, unfortunately doing delinquent things. But this pandemic has kind of snatched them and jolted them back into the reality that, you know, it's not safe and you have to be careful. And a lot of them have questions around how do I keep myself safe? How do I keep my kids safe? but also participate in this movement because mm -hmm. it's important for my children to know, you know, whether they're white or black or Hispanic or whoever, the families I'm getting are feeling like it's important for my children to know, you know, what's going on and to be a part of this, this necessary change, but really not sure how to do it while keeping them safe. So that's been the biggest issue around it is how to do it and keep them safe. And a lot of my families have had some great ideas. You know, they have from sitting their children down and talking to them, asking them they want to participate in these protests or asking them how they want to participate. I've had some families actually take their kids in the garage with, with um, art, YouTube, art equipment and make signs and, you know, what it, what they wanted to say and have them actually go out and participate in peaceful protests. Um, so it's been a really interesting journey to kind of watch how the families are trying to, um, you know, deal with this, but also incorporate the youth because, you know, they're our future. So I think that, that's been the biggest thing for me is watching the family try to incorporate the youth and make sure that they are a part of this change and they're like they're the foundation for it as well. They're holding it up and making sure that they understand the importance of moving forward with a peaceful understanding and you know a non-biased eye. Mm. I, yeah. So for me with my clients, I'm seeing largely a number of my clients, number of them who are black, also individuals from the queer community. I'm seeing a lot of sadness. I'm seeing um, a lot of anger for those individuals that are allies to black people. Mm -hmm. And again, that feeling of helplessness is coming up too. And it's adding to this whole mixture of emotions, this ball of mixture of emotions mm -hmm. that people are already experiencing mm -hmm. under COVID-19 and that pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the most important things that any of us can do is seek out education. So for me, I struggle, you know, I just in full transparency, as we talked about, what is it that white, white allies can do people majority culture? Mm -hmm. um, I feel really hard pressed to answer that question. Mm -hmm. But then as I sat here, I think it's important that I say this, that it's important that you're just not a racist, but that you're an anti-racist. Mm -hmm. So I need to see you doing some education, right? Mm -hmm. That's really important. If you say that you're our ally, it takes more than a hashtag takes more than you just waving a sign, know fully what that work looks like or else you're gonna do harm. Mm -hmm. So please be reading anti-racism literature um, and share that information with your family, share that information with your friends 
and follow personal convictions. That's strongly important. Mm -hmm. And also just for us black and brown people and people who are marginalized groups, self-care, mm -hmm. self-care. I think it was Sister Lord that said that's one of the greatest acts of political warfare. And she was an activist from back in the day. And the sister had it right. We have to take care of ourselves to move forward in this movement. We can't keep doing the work if we're falling apart. And we've already been experiencing trauma across generations, right? That's impacted us genetically mm -hmm. and that we're still experiencing today. So what does that self-care need to look like? It varies from first person to person. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I definitely agree with you on that self-care component. That is one of the other things that I've been really counseling in this whole process of going through this pandemic is how do you care for yourself? What do you, what kind of things can you do, especially considering the restriction? So it's, it's a double thing when you have the restrictions where you can't do much and then you have this thing where you need to do something. So really trying to balance that out by finding time for yourself, finding time to meditate, take walks and do things that, you know, you really enjoy to do, even if it's, you know, for a few minutes really trying to find a time to have discussions with your family. If it's around, you know, the racial injustice and there's a lot of tension around it, have an open family discussion about it. Open the floor for questions. Open the floor for, you know, suggestions and direction. Kind of just really keep it light and as you can as far as in the household. That way it can be an open topic discuss discussion. It can be something that we can just free, really talk about and really come to some some understanding instead of it being this, because you know a lot of families don't want to talk about it, especially those who are not minorities. They don't feel comfortable talking about it. But this is a topic that needs to be discussed, and it needs to be discussed with the non-biased. I like you said, get informed, find some information about what's going on before you speak on it. But definitely have those healthy conversations and speak from a truthful place of understanding. And I like what you said about non-racist. Be anti-racist when you speak. When you go and devise these plans, let it be anti-racist. You know foundation of an anti-racist. You can't, right. you can't get that res resolution if you don't have that, that foundation. That's so. right. We have another question. What is that? Sean? Yeah, so this one is talking about the recent act of racial injustice, and it says, I'm angry. So many black men and women are dying every day. The world is just starting to pay attention and listen. But I'm exhausted and drained every day by the conversations on social media and TV. How can I find peace during this time? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important because, again, this is not new. I think that's part of the frustration mm -hmm. and anger for mm -hmm. a number of people mm -hmm. that I've talked to and mine as well. It's like, this is not new, yeah. but it's new in some regard to some people who are just becoming awake to it, right? So I think a part of that self-care is boundaries, right? We don't have to track everything. You don't have to constantly be on social media. You don't have to follow every news report. So give yourself permission not to track everything as closely maybe as you once were, when all the uprising started. So consider what boundaries need to look like for you. I want to highly encourage that. Mm -hmm. I agree. I actually do not have social media. I haven't had it for years trying to set those boundaries for myself. And it's, it's been real beneficial for me at this time. I can remember a time where I was obsessed with looking at the news on my phone and trying to figure out what's going on from moment to moment with this pandemic. But as it started to you know, become confusing and overwhelming for me, I had to detach myself and you know, maybe look once a day and I encourage the same thing, create those boundaries. You know, you don't have to overwhelm yourself with the things that are on the social media. And that's across the board. You know, it can be from anything, from any kind of overwhelming stimulation, kind of just really, really regulating that and kind of trying to create those boundaries, like you said. I think that's a good idea. I know one of the things that you and Chandra talked about are ways people can move forward. Mm -hmm. How can you hold people accountable? Mm -hmm. What are some thoughts you have around that? Well, some of the things we discussed as far as moving forward, we're kind of just, you know, being able, like you said originally, just kind of practicing things from an anti-racist standpoint. That's a good step if you're a non-Black. And if you're a Black, you know, just really trying to, you know, embrace what's going on, but detach yourself as much as you can when you need those breaks, like create those boundaries. But we definitely discussed, you know, ways to support, you know, so there were some questions and some concerns around how can those of the white community support or, you know, help in this cause, those who don't agree with the, the treatment. And some of the things we, we discussed were, you know, writing a letter, you know, just really having some healthy discussion around it, joining the organization or finding some kind of movement and being a part of it, you know, peaceful protesting, bring your children out, have them peacefully protest, um, you know, writing a letter to the Congress or writing the letters are very, very good. You know, that's a good way to get your feelings on paper and get them out for someone else to read them. I think that's a, a big one. But 
join in. Even if you buy a t-shirt, we talked about all different kinds of things. There's different ways to, you know, yeah, buy your t-shirt, <laughs> wear your I'm t-shirt. Mom, yeah, <laughs> exactly. And you, you know, you ne- that's a big statement, you know, wearing these things are a very big statement. So whatever little things you can do are great too, you know, from buying a t-shirt or a wristband or, you know, what have you. I think those are some good ways to, to help and definitely some good ways to show your support to others. I like the t-shirt idea because it kind of, it's, it's really small, but it does it does represent you wearing something on you that you, that means a lot to you, you know, supporting yeah. that cause. To the black community, I want to say, give yourselves grace. My people, give yourself grace. So, and I say that because I think as we see what's happening in the media and the news, and you see people out there protesting in the streets, and I'm a frontline person, I got to tell you, I, 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 I'm out there. But not everybody has to be. So it's okay if that's not you. So give yourself grace. Give yourself permission to do some of the other, these other things that she's talking about, whether it's wear the T-shirt, civic engagement, write your legislator, um, fight against legislation that doesn't represent us and policies. All of that matters. So be sure that you're not minimizing your efforts because that adds to that ball, that mixture of emotions, right? Of the feelings of helplessness and sadness because it can feel like I'm not doing enough. But what you're doing likely is a lot. So make sure you don't minimize that. Yeah, that's exactly my, one of my good friends, you know, she reached out to me a couple of weeks ago and she was just, she was so upset with herself because she felt like she wasn't on the front line. And, but she was also afraid because there was a lot of aggressive protesting going on and things that she felt like she could get hurt. You know, I was on the front line too. And I explained to her my experience with the tear gas and how it was just really one of those things that kind of really set me back and kind of had me thinking. And she was so upset because she wanted to be involved, but she didn't know how she could get herself involved without putting herself in danger. And, you know, I told her the same thing, you know, you can protest from afar, you know, support black businesses, try to get people to support different things that you believe in as it relates to this pandemic and the crises and the the racial unjust, like, you know, reach out, you have social platforms, reach out in those ways. And, um, she seemed to feel really good about that. You know, once we talked about it and I even told her, you know, we can find some peaceful protests to go to that we don't have to be afraid of and I'll go with you. So just really even supporting her in that, you know, but really giving her that confidence and comfort to know that you can support from home. You don't have to be on the front line. Like you said, you can support in different ways and you don't have to be bad, feel bad about it. Give yourself grace. Don't beat yourself up about these things. You don't have to be on the front line to be for the cause. Yeah, one of the things that I love seeing is when I drive home, on my way home is seeing white neighbors and allies who are standing on the curb or at an intersection with their signs Mm -hmm. saying honk for Black Lives Matter, that sort of thing. Those are ways in which you're showing that you support the Black community, that you support your neighbors, and we feel that love. So thank you for that. But keep doing the anti-racism education. Do more of that. (laughs) We have a question. Yeah, so this one comes from Jane on Facebook, and she writes, any suggestions for managing the intense emotions of others during this time? Some people in my network respond very strongly to me as I try to engage in anti-racism, although I believe I'm not acting antagonistically or disrespectfully. Hmm. I have a strong thought and opinion on that. Do you please. want to go with my Please go ahead. Um, <laughs> you don't have to manage their emotions. Mm-hmm. Those are their emotions. Please. Let them right. manage that. So your work is protecting self, that's the self-care, mm-hmm. and setting some boundaries. Mm-hmm. So free yourself from feeling the need to manage their emotions. That's not your work. That's not your responsibility. You just set the boundary. I couldn't have said it better. <laughs> that's exactly right. Don't worry about their feelings around it, especially if you're trying to do something positive and for a cause. People are going to feel that way. People are going to have indifferent feelings. You just go with it. You know, Go with what feels right for you. Try not to offend anyone if you can't help it. But hey, if it does, you know, it is what it is if you're if you're about something positive and good. I think that some people have come into this work um, with some naivete Mm -hmm. and not really counting the cost. And I think some people are just now experiencing the cost. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about, again, white allies and friends. And so as you do experience that, just know that the losses that your Black friends have experienced, the trauma, the pain we've gone through has been so much greater. Mm -hmm. So consider that as you continue to support us in the work that you're doing and just know we're grateful and thank you for the love. And we know it's hard, but keep pressing forward. We have another question. So this one says, how do you know when your mental health is at risk during this time? When does the anger and sadness turn into something I need to address in therapy? 
I think that the anger and sadness itself should be enough. You know, if you're starting to feel angry and sad about something, it's going to lead to some other things. So just going on ahead and addressing that anger and sadness right away. Don't wait for it to turn into something else um, because those things are usually what build into something else. So my suggestion is if you're feeling angry or sad, please address it. You know, look it right on, figure out what's creating this anger or this sadness and kind of try to break it down and figure out how to work through it. You know, get some support if you need some Call on a friend or a family if you're feeling angry or sad and you need to vent. Definitely use your supports and your resources around those feelings. You know, don't wait for those to fester into something worse. That's my suggestion. Yeah, I'm with that. Mm -hmm. I'm with that. I wholeheartedly agree. I'm just really grateful as we get ready to wrap up that we can have this conversation, that more families are having this conversation, Mm -hmm. that our country is having this conversation. And I really want to encourage everyone, no matter where they're at, within their own departments and organizations, to look within. So start with yourself, but look at practices of where you work in your local area, whatever group you're a part of in the organization or with outside the organization, in the community, mm-hmm. whatever religious group that you're within. Make sure that practices are equitable. Take a hard look at yourself. It's easy to think because maybe you're part of a group that's already doing really good work that there's not a whole lot more for you to do. But if you listen to the people that are working with you, chances are they'll say, yes, there's some improvements that can be made. So be willing to listen, be willing to hear them out, have those hard conversations. Don't think that what you have planned is enough. Have those side conversations. Meet with that group that's reaching out to you that has some additional feedback and things to say. So change can come that you otherwise are blinded to. Continue to move toward change and understanding. I think that's the biggest message here is you guys continue to move. Let's let's continue to move forward with trying to gain some knowledge of what's going on as opposed to just assuming or assuming not. I think that that's the best goal. Well, thank you both so much for being a part of today's conversation. We really appreciate the dialogue that each of you have shared. And we hope that you will share these videos on our social media platforms with your network. Because as we all know, In order to learn and move forward, we have to support each other. If you're facing a mental health crisis and you really want to talk to someone about those feelings that you're going through, Chris 180 is here to support you. As you know, we have panelists here from our DeKalb office and our Gwinnett office, and we also have offices in Fulton County and other satellite locations. You can go to Chris180.org to find a location near you, and we'd be happy to talk to you via telehealth or in person when the situation allows please feel free to reach out to us and let us know what other topics you want to hear from us in this time period. Now, what can we do best to serve you, our community, during this time? We appreciate you all joining us, and I appreciate Tashara and Fanta for being here today. Thank you all so much, and we'll see you next week.